Okay, so, so the next thing that I'm going to talk about uh, is pharmacological uh, treatment of uh, cognitive and behavioral problems after traumatic brain injury, and this is, could probably apply to uh, other forms of acquired brain injury uh, like subarachnoid hemorrhage and what have you. Um, I will say that some of the things I'm going to be talking about are, are off-label, um, uh, so just so that you know that. Okay, so. Let's go, and I'm going to try to use this doohickey. There we go. Okay, so this is a repeat slide, but I think it's worth uh, repeating that, again, what separates the folks in all the populations that we deal with in rehab, uh, the folks that have TBI come to us with behavioral and cognitive problems. So, um, you know, trying to teach patients um, uh, what they need to do from a mobility standpoint or an ADL standpoint, if they can't pay attention or they can't concentrate or they can't remember, it's really quite a challenge. And, and, and that's one of the things that actually I like about um, brain injury rehab is that we do have these challenges and we have to think outside of the box oftentimes. Uh, and when we think about cognitive impairments and what we do with them in rehab, one of the um, uh, sort of the core uh, treatments that we provide is cognitive remediation. Um, and people have a lot of different ideas of what remediation is. Um, but by and large, I like to think of it um, as, as, as a way of determining what patients are having difficulty with, you know, what are their cognitive impairments. Um, but equally important is really what are their preserved strengths or their relative uh, preserved strengths. And we use those strengths <clears throat> to compensate for the areas that we have identified or are weak. So we may, you know, for folks who still have the capacity to read and write, we may give them a memory book so that they can remember when to take their medications or what have you. Uh, but we may also use various cognitive aids, uh, memory books, alarms, for instance, when they have appointments or they need to take medications, electronic organizers if they can use such a thing. We also provide structure to these patients so that their schedules are somewhat similar day to day, so they don't have to kind of think too much of what am I supposed to do today. Um, uh, so these are things that, that, that we use, and, um, and, and they are successful. And in fact, um, uh, Keith Cicerone uh, in 2000, 2005, and also I think it was 2012, um, uh, did an extensive review of the literature to determine whether or not um, the techniques we use uh, to treat uh, cognitive impairments are effective and in fact they are. Okay, we're going to turn our attention as a lead up to lower limb orthotics. And the reason that people wear braces is because they have difficulty walking. Uh, maybe the difficulty is pain, maybe the difficulty is foot drop, uh, you don't want the person to trip in swing phase, maybe the difficulty is uh, poor stability in stance phase. And as you can see, I've organized this by uh, phases of gait. And uh, starting with early uh, amid stance and starting with the ankle. Now, one of the uh, very serious problems is a foot slap. Uh, and that simply means that the individual does not have a controlled transition from heel contact to foot slap. The foot slaps the ground. And we think, of course, of dorsi flexors. We saw the EMG records. Dorsies are active in early stance. They're active throughout swing phase, but they're also active in early stance. In a way even more serious, is the toe walker, the person who strikes on the toes. That is never normal. I qualified the discussion this morning saying I was referring uh, primarily to adults, barefoot adults walking on a level surface. Well, the fact of the matter is nobody, and that includes children, uh, will strike on the toes as a normal mode. Even baby, when baby first starts to walk, he plops the entire foot down on the ground and then gradually matures into the heel contact. So never is toe contact a normal phenomenon. I think systematically the best bet is to start with the foot and to rule out problems with the foot, problems with the ankle, move up to the knee, move up to the hip. 
Uh, look for combinations. Look for synergies or syndromes uh, to give you a fuller picture. Uh, flex knee gait, uh, you, uh, if you're going to walk in a crouched manner, then you need much more extension torque to uh, uh, compensate so you don't fall. This is the skier's gait. Uh, skiing is the perfect sport to illustrate this, where the posture is one of flexion. Well, you better keep those quads in very good order or else you're not going to succeed at skiing.